This is the Another Way podcast. I am joined this week by writer, professor, Dr. Dorothy Marsick, mm-hmm. and also a very longtime friend. So Dorothy, I'm really excited to talk to you because, oh my gosh, you have so such a rich history, I think, and so many interesting things that you've done and you're doing. And I think you exemplify the Another Way kind of philosophy, which is all about doing things your way. So thank you for joining me. Oh, my pleasure, Emelina. Yeah. And I always like to start with how we met. So you and I met at the Midtown International Theater Festival years ago when you did a a production of Sistas. Mm -hmm. And was that the first production of Sistas or where were you? It It was the first. I'd had a couple readings of it, but that was the first production. It was a you know, a travel balloon, but it went so well. I mean, you ran that conference so fabulously and we sold every ticket. We remember we added a show and and there were always 20 people waiting at each show before it started, hoping there'd be some no shows so they could get in. It was really wonderful. Yeah, it was really great. I mean, you really used the festival environment, what it's supposed to, people forget that the festivals are really for development, you know, mm-hmm. and for this stepping stone. So I think you really used it right. You got a lot of buzz, you listened to that buzz, and you were also one of our success stories because you moved it to Off-Broadway Yeah, for years. Well, uh, yes, I invited uh, producers and some artistic directors and a producer that I had worked with before came, who was also a Broadway producer, and he he just saw how the audience was electrified. And then he um, called up Hinton Battle, who's a three-time Tony winner, said, you have to come and see this. And Hinton came on the last performance that, oh, this is fabulous. So, so Bill Franz Blau and Hinton uh, became the producers of the show when we moved it to off Broadway, and I was helping out with producing um, with a little P. Got it. Nice, nice. Yeah, and it became the longest running musical, right? On off longest Broadway. running African American musical, which is amazing. Yeah, because <laughs> if you're not in New York, it's not easy to keep things open at all, but let alone on off Broadway. So that's yeah. really remarkable. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough market off Broadway. Yeah. And now what's happening with Sistas nowadays? Well, we're licensing it out. It, it's actually, uh, I went to a rehearsal last night in um, Virginia. They're putting it up in a big performing arts center in uh, April. And then it's going up soon in Phoenix. It's just finished playing in Louisiana. So it's, you know, it's going around different places. Yeah. And that's also the perfect show for that. I mean, it's so much heart, this show. I love the mm-hmm. show. And it's so great for, you know, like um, sisters. <laughs> yeah. an American kind of community. It shows different generations. It's just before it's time in a lot of ways. Yeah. And we had people coming back nine and 10 times and always bringing, you know, friends and family. One guy came up and he said, I've run out of people to bring, you know. Uh, so it was very really um, heartwarming for me to, because I went to many shows, I did a lot of curtain speeches and just to see how the audience was electrified. And then when I went to rehearsal last night and they sounded so good, I started crying because I thought, oh, this is, did I write this? This is so good. Oh, it's the dream. And you've been able to keep it alive for so long. Yeah. And that's just one of many shows that you have. So I want to talk about, you know, a lot of your other projects, but let's also start. I I also like to start with uh, your background and kind of your upbringing and and maybe even your family, if you want to talk about that, because I think that's important in terms of, you know, how we develop in artist development. Mm -hmm. So do you want to share a, a little bit about your background? Sure. I grew up in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, which most people probably haven't heard of. Um, it's 17 miles west of Milwaukee, and I grew up in a white hood. You know, um, the guys, my brother and his friends would, hey, you guys, what you doing? You know, this was my environment. Um, and uh, I think I'm trying to remember, I've been trying to remember for a while at what age I knew I wanted to get out of there. Mm-hmm. Certainly by the time I got to high school. It was my big goal. 
I'm not going to live this way anymore. And I knew I was, I was always the smartest kid in my class. I went to real small grade schools. I went to a big high school. And I, I knew that was my ticket out. So I, I studied a lot. I always took extra classes in high school. And um, then I went to the University of Wisconsin and was just overwhelmed with this world. You know, I mean, as I grew up in this tiny little town of all white people in Pewaukee, and suddenly I went to Madison, Wisconsin, there are people from all over the world at every color and ethnicity you can imagine. And it was really opened my mind in ways that I, I might not, not have opened. I, I grew up as a Lutheran. I, I not a Lutheran anymore. I'm a member of the Baha'i faith, but I, I got a scholarship to a Lutheran college in Iowa and my mother wouldn't let me go because it was too far away. So I went, ended up going to Madison and, you know, my life would be so different if I had gone to that white college with all the white, I mean, that Lutheran college that had all white students in it from the Midwest. Um, and I don't think my mother realized that she was really changing my life by not letting me go to Lutheran College. But I'm so grateful to her. Wow. Oh, well, that's cool. And do, at what point did you know you wanted to pursue the arts? Well, you know, I was always interested in playwriting. When I was in grade school, I was writing plays that we put on for okay. the class. When I was like six, I was writing plays or writing my, I was developing them. I don't know if I wrote them down and selling tickets for five cents to neighborhood kids. And I had a, a an army blanket tent that I put up for our stage. And, you know, a lot of the career development, they say, look back to what you wanted to do when you were very young, because it's probably going to tell you what your basic interests and skills are. Mm -hmm. And so I was in productions in high school and I started in college majoring in theater. And I, I loved it. I had some great theater teachers and, and communication. And then it, I, I won't go into all the details, but I ended up getting out of theater. I went into education for a while because I thought I'll save the world being a teacher. But it, I just, the level of intellectualism and was uh, bothering me. Uh, so I then I was I majored in physics for a while, astrophysics, and wow, I oh, yeah. and dance. I mean, I really went the whole thing, and I finally ended up uh, graduating in radio, TV, film, and I went to graduate school, and I was studying children's television programming, and I worked at Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood for a while. I had an internship there, mm -hmm. and um, I that got offered one at Sesame Street, but I decided to go with Mr. Rogers, because he was just such an authentic person, you know? Yeah. And then um, while I was mis working at Mr. Rogers, which was in Pittsburgh, I decided to go to graduate school. And um, I, I was in public health administration, but I took some courses in the business school in organizational behavior. And I thought, oh my God, this is my field. I want to do this. So I ended up getting a doctorate in teaching organizational behavior. My first uh, job was at Arizona State University. And I've had a number of universities. The most recent full-time uh, job I had was as uh, at uh, Vanderbilt University. And previous to that, I was a Fulbright scholar at the University of Economics in Prague. And then when I was in uh, Vanderbilt, because it's in Nashville, Music City, I started doing this research on women in popular music and found that uh, basically women went from uh, being seen as codependent to independent, from someone to watch over me to I will survive. I, mm -hmm. I did what we call content analysis research of 20,000 top 40 songs. And I was giving these presentations all over the world. And then somebody said, turn this into a musical. I don't know what a musical is, but I, you know, I got some people to work with me. And and then it got I was producing it myself for a couple of years, and then it got picked up by commercial producers in 2004. And um, it's played almost continuously since then in a hundred cities. And this and, is Sistas, right? Or is this No, this is respect. respect. This is oh, respect. right. Okay. And then Sisters grew out of respect. And um, so I got these two musicals. And it was um, maybe two or three years ago that I remembered 
that I was a theater major when I first started college. I'd forgotten. Mm. And um, I, it was like, well, I'm reclaiming what the dream that I had when I was younger, you know? And yeah. I, Beautiful. I, I loved I loved organizational behavior because of all the business disciplines, it's the most artistic and the most o- open mm. thinking one, at least I think so, because it's about I think so too. it's about how people behave in organizations, managerial psychology, and it's it's got some social science, anthropology, and you know psychology and all these things, and and I loved I loved doing it, and and when I I would periodically think about theater how much I missed it, but I, when I was teaching and I was doing, I did 2000 workshops and keynote presentations in my career. And I realized, oh, I'm up on stage here. It's like being in theater, you know? Um, So I got the need filled and then, but I ended up coming back to theater uh, without But meanwhile, you were a, you became a professor. I was a full professor for- For organizational behavior. 25 years. Right, incredible. Now I but you were also teaching, okay. But you were also were you also teaching management or leadership? Well, that, was or it. Well, that, that organizational was behavior includes manage a uh, leadership. Okay, right, right. So it is. It's okay. usually in the department of management or leadership. So oh, a lot of these seminars that I was doing were on leadership and management. Okay, cool. Yeah, amazing. I mean, I love the, you know, the whole field of organizational behavior, but I don't think I always realize not being from academia, right? Not knowing that that's what it is. Yeah. So it is interesting because I think you and I have connected on a lot of those yes. concepts, again, without realizing, and my side, <laughs> without yeah. realizing that it's organizational behavior. So yeah, that's really, so yeah, tell me a little bit about your life in academia. Um, you know, I liked being a professor. I mean, I'm a part-time professor now, but I liked being a full-time professor. The flexibility, I mean, people would say, you only teach nine hours a week. What do you do with the rest of your time? I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you know how long it takes to prepare for those nine hours? Plus you've got stu- meet with students and you're on so many committees and you have to do research or you're not going to, you're going to get fired and research and publications and yeah. So it was, it's a pretty intense life, but there is more flexibility in that than in some other kinds of work. And um, it was great with um, having kids um, because I would teach either two or three days a week. And then the rest of the work I could do some of it at home would, uh, but I, I mean, I, there were times I'd be sitting on the floor in the bathroom grading papers while my kids were in the tub. I mean, that's how I had to, you know, balance everything because there wasn't enough time to, to do everything otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let alone your whole playwriting career, which was really kind of a simultaneous career you had going on there, right? Yes, I, I did. Um, I started doing this research on uh, women in popular music in about 1998 or 99. And it just, and, and I was doing these presentations, just people were entranced by it because it mm-hmm. might be the only time in my life I was the first in something. Nobody had mm-hmm. ever looked at how women were depicted in popular music. Mm, fascinating. And so it was like, people go, oh my God, I can't believe we sang those songs. They, they knew all the lyrics, but they'd never paid attention to what they mean, you know? Yeah, yeah. Johnny get angry, Johnny get mad. I want a caveman, I want a brave man, you know? Um, and yeah. I will follow him wherever you go, I'm gonna follow you. No Which, and all those songs were written by men, basically, right? Yes. Yeah, so I didn't really look at, I wasn't looking at the writers, uh, which somebody else could do that research, but I was looking at which songs hit the top 40. So it was like demand analysis, you know, mm-hmm. what, which songs were most in demand by people. And the top 40 was something I didn't have to make up a standard. It was there, you know, you could yeah. look and see which songs had hit the top 40. And so there were, you know, of the thousands of songs that came out every year, you looked at which ones kind of spoke to people. And you might say, well, so what? But if you go back and you see like the song from 1936, number 10 song, that's why darkies were born. 
Mm. And, but it reflected the time. Right. You know? And and even those songs like uh, very codependent songs like I will follow him and Johnny get angry they they were in the in the sixties and um, we still have codependent songs now but instead of sixty five percent of the songs that are associated with women it's now thirty five percent so okay. yeah there's still people I've had, I don't know how many articles they go oh my God there's so many codependent songs it hasn't changed well. It Right, <laughs> right. Right. Songs about strong women, but there's still, you know, enough of the codependent to make your skin creep sometimes. Yeah, no, totally. Well, I mean, I feel like the music industry too is is a little bit behind. I mean, the the, the whole the film industry had its reckoning with Weinstein, and the and music industry is not quite mm. caught up yet. I think, unfortunately, wow. but it also reminds me what you're saying reminds me of of uh, like the Barbie doll. And how, you know, she was the woman who created the Barbie dolls was interviewed and asked, you know, why did you create this unrealistic body? And she's like, that's what people liked at the time. I was just mirroring mm -hmm. what people, what popular culture kind of wanted. And I think that's, that's a, the commentary that you were able to make is that, do you realize that this is what our, we want? Yeah. Well, and I think I, I wanted to write an article about this, but I never did, about how Barbie won. Because back in the 70s, when women were starting, was the 70s was the highest increase of women in the workforce. And there was a lot of push for equal wages and, you know, uh, affirmative action and so on. Um, Barbie was very popular, but the, the feminists at the time were trying to move away from how women are are judged by their body image. But if you look now at women, even in corporations, they look like Barbies. So Barbie won. Mm. You know, that's interesting. Poised hair, the boobs, the high heels. I, I can't believe high heels are, are still I know I don't either. But you know, so women some women love them. I, I can't do it. I just yeah it's painful. I was just um somebody I was just reading something yesterday. I'm trying to remember. It was some famous woman who said, "Well, I'll wear high heels once in a while, but then I have to wear trainers for three days after." That. Right. It's like, what are we doing? Like, you know, uh, they say they love them, but really, what does that mean? They love how they look in them, or they right. love actually wearing those, right? Right. Or they love the attention they get from wearing them. You know? Yeah. 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 yeah there's a lot that goes in there. It's, there's a, it's it's not an accident that in New York City where we have both lived right. that nobody wears high heels when they're walking out, but they carry sometimes in their bag and they might get into a meeting they put them on. So what does that tell you? Yeah, you know you can't wear the shoes when you're going about your average business. Right, right. And why do we have all these extra hurdles that we have to jump through? You know, I mean, I even find myself catch again, which is why I really appreciate that you did that work again, to point this out to people, because, you know, even as I'm in the process of moving and I was collecting shoes, I was like, oh, well, I have to have one pair of heels. And I'm like, wait, why? I hate heels. You know, I like to, these, these yeah. shoes, if we, if we do what's her, you know, the Marie Kondo thing, I'm like, these do not bring me joy, yeah. but I feel <laughs> like I have to have them just in case, you know? And then, and then I went through this whole thing of like, but do I want the job? that I have to wear the heels for, you know, and then it's like kind of trace it back. Yeah. Yeah. I quit wearing heels. Uh, I don't know, some years ago. Um, and, but now, but I like cute shoes. So <laughs> yeah, I, look me too. For, um, I look for ones that are cute and comfortable. They can't be just comfortable. Right. right. Cute also. <laughs> yes. I agree with you. There's a way, well, nowadays it's too, I feel like more so than ever we, we are learning, we are, have more options. Yes. So, and, and part of it is because we have more women who are creating the, the shoes yes. and the, yeah. you know, the clothes yeah. to begin with. So that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so and I do like it that women in business are, when I was teaching management full-time and doing mm -hmm. seminars, I wore, you know, Navy blue suits all the time. Um, or, or maybe once in a while something with a little bit of color. But uh, after I got into theater, I I wasn't wearing those, I was changing what I wore. And then about a year or two later, I saw these clothes in the back of my closet. And I thought, I can't wear those things. Right, right, right. But, but now women can wear more. Exactly. 
Yeah, and that's really nice. And actually kind of on that, have you noticed um, a change? Because you've been involved in the theater, especially New York theater for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed a change? And what's your kind of thoughts about like the new theater that's coming out or, or maybe a change in attitudes or perspectives or I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, what I've, I've noticed, um, well, I started noticing this about maybe eight years ago when I was, I take, I always, I'm always in a playwriting class or, or two at a time. And, and, um, and sometimes I go on retreats and I started noticing the younger playwrights were writing a lot of fantasy and there was uh, less naturalistic plays. There were more things, mm -hmm. Um, Interesting. you know, out of sequence time or, or characters that don't fit showing up and, um, and, but then I think, especially since the pandemic, that's even increased more. There's, um, and some for good, so, I mean, it's anytime you get something new, you're going to get things that work and things that don't work. And I think there's been a, um, a desire to shake things up and, some of the stuff you see, go, oh, really? <laughs> but other stuff is good. You know, you're going to, yeah. not, not everything's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, so it, uh, and there's just things that I sometimes, I feel like I'm the only one in New York that doesn't like that play. Right. Uh, but then I'll read some other reviews and find, oh, there are other people who feel like I do. Because I, I think sometimes audiences go in and the either the title or something is just, and, and they feel like they have to like it because of some socially correct or virtues signaling reason, you know? Right, um, right. And, uh, and I was like that too before I got it really into theater. When I first came to New York, I was going to like 250, 300 shows a year, plays and readings and musicals. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. I'd go to two, there was a, times I went to three a day because you could squeeze wow. them in. Yeah. I was just, I wanted to make up for lost time. But after, it took me a few years to be able to be more discerning because the beginning, I liked everything. Yeah. And yeah, if, yeah. You, if you don't see much, it's pretty, it's easier to please you. Mm -hmm. And then I, I became too critical. You know, to a point was like, I don't like this, I don't like that. So I had to sort of pull back on that also. Mm -hmm. And, but I I do notice because I see so many shows, I notice things I didn't used to notice and where I think the average theater goer probably doesn't. I mean, if you get with people, there's a lot of people in New York who see much theater. They're, they're not playwrights like me. Right. Um, they just love theater and you can get into deep discussions with them. But somebody who sees, you know, eight or 10 shows a year is just going to be at a different level. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's like, you know, you know, th what theater at its heart is intended to like, you know, arouse conversation, right. You could say. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some of these, like, I think the shows that are not as good for whatever reason, we, we think because we've been around it, we've seen a lot of theater, we understand the dramatic structure, yeah. you know, but so you've got these new shows that I feel like they don't necessarily understand the rules, but they're still provoking conversation. So it's like, yeah. Well, and I've noticed um, a trend um, and I even asked one of my playwriting teachers about it. Um, and this has been, I don't know, five or six years, I started really noticing it in my playwriting classes and things that I see up is um, uh, less of a concern for plot. In fact, one of the playwriting classes I was in, my the teacher said, oh, I think Dorothy's the only one in the class that really cares about plot. What? How can you not have plot? <laughs> you know, I don't understand it. I'm going to tell you, I don't. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. It, it's I've never liked those slice of life kind of play. Right, sounds very very David Lynchy is was where my mind went to. Yeah, uh, and it it just um, yeah, interesting. It uh, I don't know. I don't get it, but but there people like it, you know. And yeah. it's like it's a matter of taste, also, you know that. Um, some people like certain things, but I've just known that I've just noticed that trend and well, I continue to watch that to see are, are those plays going to get produced or are they not? Is the audience still want to yes. box more? I, that I don't know. 
Right. Well, that's also something else I've I've noticed in terms of things that are changing is that there seems less of a pursuit for whereas before it used to be like, OK, you, you know, maybe you started a festival and then you and you kind of take the steps, then you yeah. go off Broadway and then you go to Broadway. And now it seems like there's less um, of a desire to a go kind of straight go to Broadway. And B, I feel like there's more options of, for people getting their work out there um, that doesn't necessarily include Broadway. And so what you get there is that you get less, um, like, I don't know, like roadblocks, I guess, because people are just doing what they're able to get it out there. I mean, thanks to Zoom in part, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a good thing. I, I always felt that this, this obsession with getting to Broadway was, was not healthy for, uh, because most shows don't belong on Broadway. Yeah. You know, I've had people, I can't tell you the number of people for sisters who go, oh, this is better. You should be on Broadway. This is so much better than what. And it's not, it's not a Broadway show. I agree. I totally agree. It'll, it would lose its some of its heart, yeah. I feel like. And I've seen a number of shows that went from off-Broadway to Broadway that just, you know, died on Broadway. And if they, they could have lasted for years, like we did off Broadway. Yeah. But of course, then once you get on Broadway, even if you only last two days, then the Broadway touring companies take you and that's where you make your money is on tour. Right, right, right. So, I mean, I get it. But, but I have so many people that young playwrights would come to me. I remember, <laughs> I remember this one playwright was trying to uh, ask me for advice. And it, it, this was, well, she wasn't particularly young. She built a company and now she was like me went into playwriting as a second career and um let me just she'd only had the only thing she'd had produced was one scene in a festival somewhere in the middle of pennsylvania that nobody's ever been to okay mm -hmm. and yeah, me. so she came to me she said i you know really can you help me i said well tell me what your goals are because then i will know what advice to give you. She said, I'm going to be on Broadway next year. I thought, oh, honey. Yikes. What do you say? What do you well, say? Well, you can, because it's like, you have no idea how this works, right? Yeah. And of course, she didn't get to Broadway. And she, I, I think she even got out of playwriting. Um, but I've a number of people who would say, uh, either actors or writers will go, I'm going to be on Broadway next year. And, you're like, mm -hmm. and then, of course, oh, often so those people leave New York because um, it didn't meet their expectations. They don't realize you have to write really hard to get it. But also, Broadway isn't for everybody. Right. I mean, I've been very happy to be on off-Broadway and in regional, regional theater. It's been wonderful for me. I agree. I've really fought. I mean, I've always kind of loved the idea of off Broadway, um, just in, because it's indie, you know. Um, yeah. But I wanted to ask you because what kind of along the same lines, because there's so many directions I could go with that <laughs> when in terms of the people that are kind of, you know, have misperceptions about theater and where they're going. But I, I think I'll ask you um, what your advice would be to younger um people going into theater, maybe specifically women, uh, in part because I know that your plight has not been easy. You've kind of overcome a lot um, to get where you are. And you and, and one of the things I admire about you is that, you know, you're a very hard worker and um, you don't stop when you hit those ceilings. You figure out the problems and then keep going and, and pivot you know, if you have to find new people, if you have to. So I feel like you've kind of, in your another way journey, you've pivoted a lot. And, um, and nowadays, you know, I think there's a lot of people who don't appreciate that maybe in some ways because they, they feel like they don't have to, and maybe they don't have to, because now you can go on zoom and all of a sudden you're, you know, you could be a big success or you're an influencer. So yeah, I'm kind of curious having said all that. Well, what what you I mean, you know, I had a, podcast, it, oh gosh, it's been three years since it came out, about a book I wrote about the murder of my uncle, and we've had almost three million downloads by now. It, it was a real success, but and but uh, other people think, I'm going to do a podcast, I'm going to get three million downloads. It's not that easy, <laughs> you know, or you go on Zoom, oh, I'm going to have a, well, do you get 20 people to watch you? It's not, 
uh, just because Zoom is there, it's it's it doesn't mean you're going to have hordes of people. Right. And you sure there's those influencers, but how many of them are there compared to the number of people who wish they were influencers? Yeah, right. It, it it's nothing's easy. I think mm -hmm. that's the one. Um, everything I've done in my life is hard work. You know, I had a, a friend who said to me some years ago, Dorothy, everything's come so easy for you. I said, are you kidding? <laughs> you see two things that I do that are successful. You don't see the 98 that I tried that didn't work. Yeah. So you try two things and they're not successful. You go, oh, I'm never going to be able to do it. Right. right? And so that's, it's, and, and I look, I, I hang around with playwrights and some of whom are more talented than me, but their work hasn't gotten traction. And I've really thought about this a lot for years, several years now. What is it? I mean, they're better writers than me. Why? And I mean, part of it is, I think, it's my theory that I think strategically. So whereas I've had many playwrights, I've heard them say, well, I just thought my work would get out there. And you think, well, you write it and somebody's going to find you. You know, they're going to come knocking on your door. Maybe that, not that, but they, they'll say things like, well, I just thought, you know, it would get out there. Well, how's it going to get out there? I never thought my work was going to get out there unless I made it happen. That's why I self-produced and um, invited mm -hmm. Um, invited artistic directors and so on. I never, um, it's never worked for me to send a script out because the scripts I have, it, there's, they don't really read well compared to what's going to be on the stage. And so nobody, and, and they're a little, they're different too. So people go, oh, but if they see it, they go, oh yeah, that's great. So I, I kind of knew I had to make it happen. And when it costs money to do that, you know, and it's a risk. Um, so that's, and, and thinking strategically, well, how do I get from A to B? Mm -hmm. So when I was doing Respect in, in Nashville, it started out as a presentation. I turned it into a one woman show. And then I got these three women to work with me and we developed a script and we were doing these small gigs all around Nashville and some, a few other places in the country. And I kept waiting for a theatrical producer to come and discover me because the show was electric. Everybody was, you know, on fire watching it. And then after a couple of years, I realized, you know, theatrical producers don't come to Nashville. So I sat down with a friend of mine whose mother was our first groupie. She was um, like around in her fifties and she came to every show we did and she'd always bring some of her friends. And so my friend Laura and I, we sat down, we said, let's use her as an example. If this is our target market. It's middle-aged women who enjoy theater. They've got a habit pattern of going to theater and they have enough expendable income they can buy some tickets. Where are a large number of them? South Florida. <laughs> so I went to, I, I flew down to Florida Spent a few days there. I found a theater, Hollywood Playhouse, which is no longer a theater, but um, and booked it for six shows in four days. I bought TV and radio ads and newspaper ads and called reporters and um, had um, other ways of you know get audience development. And I invited every artistic director in South Florida and every producer. And out of that, I got two producers who wanted to run it commercially. But nobody came to me. And I had to borrow money to do that because by this time I'd gone through my life savings uh, building this show up. And, but it was, it was a, a worth, I mean, the risk, it might not have worked out. I might have just lost everything. But in fact, it did work out and, and the show opened in West Palm Beach in 2004, and then it's like played in you know, hundred cities now. But that, um, you, you know, and then I've had people come to me and go, well, how do I get my show up? Well, you know, start send, uh, contacting theaters or put it up and invite, you know, artistic directors or, um, 
and I, I, I tell people, do the Lord, look at Lord theaters and go, you know, uh, try to find the ethnic group that your play is on because um, there might be organizations around the country. And then people will go, oh, that's so much work. Right. Well, yeah, it, I mean, that's how you're going to show up. That's how you get people to sign on. So I think what, what you were saying, because I, I think strategically, and I do work hard, and I, I just don't expect anything to fall in my lap. Um, I don't know how you exactly teach that to people. Right. It's There's a book called Grit, which is about that. Can you just keep working at things? Mm -hmm. and, but I think it's partly a personality trait. Mm. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, you got to find what works for you. And some right. people, not everybody's an entrepreneur because what I had to be was an entrepreneur. Yes. And uh, not everybody's suited to be an entrepreneur and they could lose everything by trying. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not telling everybody to go out and do that. But if, but if you want to and you have the capabilities, um, then... For me, it paid off, and I'm really grateful that I did it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think where you know where I start with artists is trying to figure out, go into, uh, you know, find their authentic self and find out why they want to do it. And you know, that's that air, that's that space where you start to realize, do I have that grit in me? Do yes. I want to do the work? You know, and if you if so, if you kind of go inward and do that authentic work work first, mm -hmm. I think in theory you can find that. But I'd also say I've come across so many artists who really believe that their work is so good, they're just going to get discovered, basically. And that does not happen, you know? No. And it also, when I made that realization, <laughs> when I realized, you know, probably from doing the festival and seeing so many great shows mm -hmm. that I really loved and believed in, just not go anywhere, that it doesn't, I mean, that's just a small factor. Being good is just a small factor. And this is, again, across the arts, you know? And it made me realize, looking back, how many artists have we not heard from, you know, and the ones that we are hearing from to go back to your point earlier about the music, you know, the ones we are hearing from are the ones who have usually been um, handcrafted by the establishment, if you will, or, you know, these like probably white men at the top saying that, okay, you're, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose you, you know, and there's obviously some hard work and stuff that goes into there as well. But my point is that there's so many people that we're not hearing from. Yes. Um, because of it for whatever reason. So I agree. It takes hard work. I think that's a precious message. And, and, you know, it's that, I don't know if you remember that Kenny Rogers song, The Gambler, no one to hold them, no one to fold them. Oh, yeah. Because there's projects that I've started that just don't mm -hmm. go anywhere. And at some point you realize this isn't going to go anywhere. Yes. But the ones that for me, it's, I, I look at the audience a lot. Is the audience really engaged? Are they electrified? Then I know I have something. Mm. Otherwise, you know, leave it and do something else. Because I've seen people push stuff that, you know, audiences are falling asleep. And it's like, yeah. can't you notice that right, right. what's going on there? Yeah, and, pivot. Learn how to yeah, pivot. and to pivot. Exactly. To be able to. And that's part of, I think, being an entrepreneur, sensing the environment. What are the needs? And I try to do this. It's not working. So I'm going to pivot and do that and find out what, like your own strengths, that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. What are my strengths? What can I bring to it? And how do I, how do I develop it? I mean, going back to the Midtown Festival, we were, Sisters was nominated for a number of awards. And the only one we won was most tickets sold. <laughs> And but that's a great, that's a great prize, actually. You know, my daughter came with me, my daughter, who was an economics major yeah. in college. Yeah. She whispered to me, she goes, Mom, this is the only quantitative measure here. Yeah. And now I could have gotten really depressed that we didn't win all these artistic awards. But where are those shows now? Yeah. Like Best Musical. Was, yeah, exactly. So um, having Ooh, more really. tickets sold was was a good one to win. Yeah, that makes me want to look back at the other other years of the shows that won those. Yeah, oh, it is yes, good, it is a good winning. Yeah, I love because that. if you're in, I mean, I've spent my life in theater in commercial theater, and it, it's you know there's a lot of overlap with nonprofit theater, but but the main difference is. In nonprofit, you, you have fundraisers and donors and 
Oh, so you can put up shows that maybe you're not going to sell as many tickets. Mm -hmm. But in commercial theater, if you don't sell tickets, you close. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And and so I've always had to have that. We've got to sell tickets. Yeah, I think it's a good measure. I really do because you know if there's if nobody is going to see your show, you have to really think why am I doing this? And or maybe my the reason why I'm doing this is not being communicated. You know, yes. maybe it's not coming through. So yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh my gosh, we're coming up to time. Uh, I knew this was going to happen, but I want to hear about what you're doing now. Um, you know, we've touched on your shows. You mentioned your podcast. We talked about your teaching, your your mm -hmm. lecturing and speaking. Um, I, you've just done so much, but you, I, you've got a lot happening right now and coming up. So tell us about that. Well, one thing I'm working on a lot is, um, I'm putting a, an online course on the Udemy platform on management skills. It's taken a long time to do it, but it's very rewarding. And then I'm working on several plays. I, I one that I, I, had it done last year and then I, I showed it to my producer. He said, I don't think the stakes are high enough. So I rewrote the whole thing, restructured everything and just finished the first draft of that this past week. It's about the McCarthy era. And cause I think there's a lot of commonalities with what happened then with now. And, but it's a love story. So just like the movie, uh, Billy Elliot had his experience as a dancer in the foreground and the minor strike in the background. Mm -hmm. I wrote the play so that the McCarthy era and the FBI and all of the House on American activities is in the background and the foreground is a love story. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a play about uh, incest in a biracial family. We had a, a reading of it at the National Black Theater Conference this summer. I've got another play I've been working on and um, just sent it out. It's about a father who kidnaps a daughter and the mother doesn't see. Yeah, that one I've seen and is phenomenal. Yeah. You really have a handle on dialogue and nuance oh, yes. and subtle, subtle things. And it was really starting to take off and then COVID came and it just, right. you know, and then I've got some other ones that I've been working on for a while that I kind of put aside, but I want to get back to that are fun. One is about, um, um, a couple in in therapy um, who's, they have the Buddha and a hitman appear, but they also get in the business of comfort chickens and buying chicken diapers, which is really a thing. <laughs> of course. Yes. Because then, <laughs> and then another one about a mother who sells her daughter's body parts. So, uh, which Emmeline and I yes. have worked on a little bit. So, so I've got, yeah, I've got all that. And then you also mentioned, if you're uh, okay talking about it, that you're going to be speaking at this UN Delegate of Women. Oh, yes. I do that every, well, it hasn't been for uh, three years because of COVID. This is the first time uh, since, uh, well, we, it, it sort of halfway was in 2020. So two years it wasn't there. I'm a delegate um, to the Commission on the Status of Women at the United Nations. And like 30,000 people come from all over the world for this two weeks. And uh, it's, I'd say about a third of them are government and two thirds are NGOs, non-governmental organizations that are dealing with things like female genital mutilation and human trafficking and, and widows in Uganda, because in some countries, uh, when, if the husband dies, the woman is, you know, she loses everything. And um, it's just, and, and the women I work with on that are really interesting. I know, you know, we've had some difficult times in the US and I've had friends who've gotten very discouraged and oh, there's no hope, there's no, I said, you have to come with me to the UN, to the Commission on the Status of Women because you get, you know, 30,000 people who are trying to change the world mm -hmm. for the better. And the, the real key is they believe they can. Yeah. And so the energy and the excitement and, and they're all working on projects around the world right so it's you realize there are things going on but if you just watch the news all the time you can just right. end up in a psych ward with depression because it's so awful but just to keep in mind there are things happening mm. there's institutions falling apart but there's also things building up and there's a whole you know these you know, more than the 30,000 people, there's hundreds of thousands of people around the world doing these. And it doesn't take everybody. It just takes a number who are really committed 
and believe in it and start working together. And that's why I love going to this. UN. Yeah. Oh my God. What a great way to end this too. It's part of it. It's called the commission on the status of women. Yes. The UN commission on the status of CSW commission, on the status of women. Yeah. I didn't even know that existed. So that's amazing that they're, you know, coming yeah, every together. March, early March, every year. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. So thank you so much oh, for thank joining. Thank you, Evelina. Yeah, and telling us all about your journey. All your new things. Yeah, and um, do you have any kind of final comments you want to head out with? You know, as Rumi, the poet, the Persian poet Rumi said, respond to promptings of your inner spirit. Mm. Listen to what your your gut and your you know, telling you that you're drawn to and then spend a, enough time. Maybe you can't do it as a full time living. But what I've found working with people is that if you get buried under the musts and the shoulds of life, which we all have, you're you just become demoralized, your energy levels low. But the more you can do things that you like and love, you're going to be energized and find you have resources you didn't even know you had. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Then that hard work is a little less hard. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank awesome. you, Emelina.